Hi, I'm Jeff Yargo. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mojica. I'm a professor of chemistry at the School of Molecular Sciences. So, Vladi, we're making another video today looking at, um, in Atkins, Physical Chemistry for the Life Sciences, edition number two. And uh, we've been looking at the second part of his book, which is looking at kinetics. Um, and specifically, the first chapter in there, chapter six, which is looking at the basic of uh, the basics of chemical kinetics. Um, and the discussion question number five says, um, define the terms in and limit uh, the generality of the expression. And the expression they give is the Arrhenius equation. In fact, I would say, like, actually, I I don't know about you, like, I tend to you know, see it either in this way, I would, I would actually say the, the, the way I would almost say is more general is to see it like, you know, that, right? Um, and I, I would, I guess the other thing I would say right off the bat is instead of R, you often see uh, a Boltzmann's constant. Right, um, that, that would be just scaling. It's scaling it by the Avogadro's right. number. But you know, since I did my PhD in Sweden, uh -huh. Uppsala, Uppsala, right? Uppsala University. So this gentleman here was a Swedish physical chemistry by the name of Svante Arrhenius. And you know, the, the amazing thing about this equation is that actually he came up with this idea almost by accident, examining how rate constant dependent on temperature, but, but he, he didn't really have a molecular model of this. And the other thing is that this looks suspiciously like Boltzmann distribution, but it's not. This is a different creature that, that, that has, the, both of them are connected by the role of thermal excitations. Yeah. And how they operate in this, but we will talk about that at some other point. I, I, I just wanted to, you know, to recognize my connection to the, to the Swedish Well, and I, I think, but I, I do think it, it is worth noting, like you said, like you, anytime you start seeing like, you know, uh, exponential growth or, or, you know, natural log type properties. I mean, like you see this in, you know, compound interests, you know, how things grow in economics. I mean, the, you know, seeing these type of, you know, exponential versus natural log, you, you run across in all sorts of, you know, uh, chemical kinetics is in thermo in molecular thermodynamics and in, in um, uh, you know a bunch of different areas. So uh, mm -hmm. you're right in that it's not uncommon. In fact, I would say it's one of the things almost all you know biochemists you know have to get accustomed to is is dealing with um, you know natural log properties because so right. many things yeah. vary in these kind of compound growth type ways or, or compact loss type ways. And the, and the other thing is the ubiquitous role of temperature in so many physical chemistry equations. Because you see, the, the fact that temperature shows up here as the, this depends on the reaction, this depends on the reaction, this is fixed by the environment. So this is a situation in which the rate constant is defined, the, the, the environment sets the temperature, and this is what goes in there. And it's almost a miracle that you don't need anything else. Because you see, the environment consists it's of zillions of, of particles, yeah. atoms, molecules. And nevertheless, the only thing that enters when you have a chemical reaction happening at a constant temperature the only information you need about the environment is T and nothing else. So, I mean, in principle, imagine that you were in, a, in, a, in an open market and you were interacting with zillions of you know, people here and whatever. So it, 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 it might look at uh, you know, at first glance that you might need information about all the details, collisions. No. Turns out, no. Just the kinetic energy. Just the yeah. kinetic energy and this, this uh, thermal interaction that plays a, such, such an important role here. Right. I think also practically it, it's, uh, you know, as you've shown here, you know, where we often 
you know, end up measuring this. So, um, you know, this Arrhenius equation, I mean, is something we, we often end up, you know, trying to figure out what these activation energies are, right? I mean, that's a fairly common thing to experimentally want to determine. Um, and we often do this by doing reactions at several different temperatures so that we can, but where you do the reaction at say four or five different temperatures as across the big range as you can and look at how that rate constant, you know, changes. And if we plot the LN of that, because the reason I think you, you often see it written in this way is because it's written in this kind of linear form where this shows you, you know, kind of the slope and intercept and what you might want to get out of this, which are, you know, it's asking us to define these terms. So maybe we should just do that one at a time. We're looking at, you know, how the rate constant changes and what is, you know, what I think of as the erroneous terms are this energy, you know, in this A term here. Right? You've defined one, which is temperature, and then some either gas constant or Boltzmann constant, uh, et cetera. And so the Arrhenius um, you know, variables here are A and, and the EA, which is usually standard activation energy, right? right? And then this one, you know, to me often gets the, in fact, I like to put it in this form because it kind of gives it its self-explanation term, the pre-exponential factor, right. you know, <clears throat> that's pretty self-explanatory when you put it in that form right, right. there. Right, <laughs> but then, yes, that's true. But at the same time, this pre-exponential factor, unless we come up with some a microscopic description of kinetics, it's very hard to give any meaning to this. I mean, at this point, it's just uh, the pre-exponential factor. It turns both out them, that it's Both is of them right connected. now, yeah. I mean, we've, we've hinted to one because we've called it an activation energy. Right. So we've already almost kind of defined what we mean by that, you know, by, by instead of just giving it a variable B, you know. Um, but, you know, like you said, the pre-exponential factor, it doesn't give much away about what it is from molecular standpoints. While saying right. that it's the activation energy, it kind of gives you a hint at the molecular level of, you know, what you're looking at. Right. There. It's only when you come up, let's say, with the simplest model for chemical reactions, which is a collision model. Yeah. And then, then you, you can then, say how Then you discover that this thing is connected to the minimum relative energy that two molecules or atoms must have in order for a reaction to be effective. So it gives you a, a molecular interpretation and you also get a molecular interpretation of this one, which in collision theory turns out to depend on the temperature too. So, but, but that's another thing. So, so you get this as connected to the number of but collision. like you said, it, but I think you brought a huge point there. It depends on the theory you're looking at. In collision theory, it's you know the the you know it's the it's the kinetic energy of collisions for the energy. It's the number of you know uh, collisions. That, you know, but but it, it's dependent on the molecular theory. It, it, it's dependent on the microscopics you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, so now I think of this as being you know, one of the most useful diagrams you run across in chemistry because it puts visually what you really want people to get across about, you know, uh, one of the two Arrhenius parameters, which is the activation energy. And the one that you would say gets calculated and gets, you know, in, in modern papers to, you know, some of, uh, you know, over the last hundred years, I mean, this becomes a very important factor because of what you see right here. What kind of energy barriers do you have between some reactants and some product? And it's not just enough to know that the products are at a lower energy, that, that you're gonna, you know, that this has a spontaneous nature, that if it can't overcome these activation energies, that it doesn't matter you know, that it's at a lower, that mm. that's going to dictate a lot of the practicality as a function of time, whether it's going to get there or not. And it is interesting what we have here, potential energy. What is this <clears throat> potential energy? Let's say that you have two different nuclei, A and B, and you are looking at the reaction between A and B. So this potential energy, let's call it E of R, E, R, E, B. Yeah. It gives you 
the potential energy of interaction that comes from the direct interaction between the charges of the nuclei and the electrons in between. So to get this quantity, you need to solve Schrodinger equation. Right. And I think we should mention here, like I want to say, you know, Atkins' book does a, a good job in previous chapters of, of uh, going through, like, for example, potentials with Coulomb, you exactly. know, potential between things. And how does it, you know, depend on angle, you know, with respect to two being zero versus if it, you know, how it does across space and why do things come together, et cetera, in certain ways. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to plot E, not as a progress of reaction, but uh, as a function of, yeah, as a function one of, of the, the distance. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Oh, I got it. There we go. So you will find that reactants are somewhere here. Products are somewhere there. So you have to move from here to here. And this is exactly this profile. So this is what is taking you from reactants to products, products. Yeah. in this energy landscape. So it is taking you from, from a well, a potential energy well that corresponds to the energy of the reactants. You have to climb a hill and then get to the other valley. So you go from one valley to the other valley. So, so it's like a walking on a mountain range. You have to go from a valley and, and this particular path is the minimum energy path. So you're climbing, but you are not climbing in a way that you are spending more energy than you should. And so each step, so, so this is the idea. So this connects this in a very deep way to a molecular level description. Right. And, you know, uh, as you mentioned earlier, like, um, you know, it's temperature. You know, it's it, the one variable that plays such a critical role here is temperature. And, you know, is are you at a high enough temperature to get over, you know, those barriers? And that's often what students are asked you know, to look at in this is, is that what is, is not only to calculate that activation barrier, but in a sense when they're calculating it by doing, by measuring reaction rates as a function of temperature, what they're getting is, you know, what temperatures does it take to get over those barriers? Right. And again, in the collision model, this is relatively simple because you are looking at collisions between A and B, as, as you increase the temperature, the relative kinetic energy of A and B is going to increase. Right. So eventually, you will get to the threshold energy, which is the activation energy that you need for the reaction to be effective. But this is a very simplistic yes, model very that simplistic. is typically doesn't make its way outside of right, gas phase. Right, 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 right. You know, and when you get to biological systems, which is, you know, this, you know, you would say, you know, isn't very applicable at all. No, you know, no, no, because uh, you cannot, it, you know, you cannot use all the concept, right. concept from gas collision. But what does, you know, get fairly applicable when you start getting into, you know, biological systems, though, is, in a sense, changing these potential energy landscapes around a lot. In fact, you would say, you know, catalysis, specifically what, you know, biochemists would say enzymes, you know, you know, play a central role in not you know, per se, changing these collision energies, et cetera, but changing these potential landscapes, changing these activation barriers around. Um, right. And, and this plot cor corresponds to this, what's called transition, transition state theory or transition state model of uh, chemical reactions. And then we realize that in a particular chemical reaction, you might have the, the maxima of this because this is progress of reaction. This represents molecular configurations. So these are transition states. Whereas the minima, they correspond to intermediate state. Actually, this should go all the way down there. I don't know what happened. So this is a transition state, the maxima, and a minima would be the intermediate state. So these are states that the chemical reaction goes through. Right. And these are barriers. This is one barrier, another barrier, and another barrier that intervene. <coughs> this is way more complicated than the other one, which, which was a, a single barrier. Right. So here and, we have, and oftentimes that gets like, like you said, like, oh, well, most people don't do concentrates. But what we had earlier, just A going to P products, you know, you'll see A going to, and they usually even use like an I intermediate to products where you'll see, you know, certain types of intermediate build and then come back down 
you know, as a function of, um, you know, time over some concentration, while, you know, the uh, reactants might just decay, the products might just build, but you get intermediate um, concentrations of some of these intermediate things that, that build and then, you know, decay off in these processes. Yeah. Um, so, and I, you know, this is getting to, you know, this effect of catalysis, which is, you know, heavily used in biology, you would say. I mean, um, biology works over a narrow window in temperature space. So it doesn't, you, you know, often you, you use big changes in temperatures to try to get over, you know, activation barriers. It usually, you know, takes a different way around this. It usually picks, you know, catalysis as a way to just change the activation barriers. Right, and, and then we see, because of the exponential dependence on the activation energy, even small change into the activation energy, which might be the one, might be the one involving in changing the original path to the catalytic path, the new path, even small <coughs> changes translate into big changes in the reaction rate because of this exponential dependence. So now we see that this activation energy plays a crucial role in biology too, because we might have, I, th I think we mentioned this in one of the discussion, you take uh, many reactions that happen in our body and you try to run these reactions outside of the catalytic environment, then you discover that you need perhaps 100 Celsius to, to run yeah. this, exactly the same reaction. That is in, the, in your body being in your done body, at 30. In your so, body yeah. happens at uh, 38 Celsius. Yeah, th and, and the reason for this is that in your body, it doesn't follow this path, this is the original path. It follows this other path that is the catalytic path. And we understand, it's quite clear, that the, the presence, the action of a, cata of a catalyst does not change the equilibrium constant, but it changes dramatically the reaction rate. Yes. So this is, we have to understand it. The, 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 the product state and the, the equilibrium is determined by this long time behavior. Right. Whereas the actual kinetics happens here. And the kinetics is dramatically changed by the presence of the catalyst. Right. Now, I also like to remind, like, you know, back to kind of some, I guess, classic chemistry, or even I would say it probably gets used more in geochemistry. But, you know, while, you know, this just changing these activation barriers, changing this to this new path in biology, you know, through catalysis is the most common, you know, but... Um, you know, just to bring it back to some basic thermodynamics, like, you know, oftentimes you can also, you know, do this with variables like pressure, you know, where, you know, pressure isn't, you know, overall changing the amount of kinetic energy, but you can change those potentials a lot, you know, with variables like pressure or how you change volumes of things. So, yeah, you might not give it a lot more energy, but you can go up and high enough in pressure where you get rid of you know, some of these activation barriers. Right, and I think there is a very interesting example. You know, if we had a situation where the activation energy is equal to zero, then we have, it's, a, it's not a very common situation, but, but then you have an activation less right. reaction. Now, it turns out that one of the modern theories about the role of enzymes, enzymes are biological catalyst, is that the enzyme actually forces the reaction center into, into a configuration that would be impossible in gas phase. So it's, it's, it's like a, 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 a sumo wrestler. It's forcing these this small molecules to get to the reaction configuration, but this could be impossible in gas phase because the barrier for that would be huge. huge. But this, the molecular sumo wrestler, the enzyme, forces them to do that. And once you are in that configuration, the reaction happens with zero activation energy. Right. So it, it's a very particular case of catalyst that finds a path where actually this is reduced to zero. And it happens in biology too. We didn't, it, it is not, I mean, it, it is, it hasn't been around for a long time, but it's a new model for the action of some enzymes. So we, now we talk about molecules reacting in constrained space, constrained, constrained geometries with activation activation that's reaction. Yeah, well, and like you said, this really gets at the heart of biochemistry where, you know, we often care about those, uh, you know, 
enzymes, you know, enzyme kinetics, uh, which we're going to get to uh, towards the end of this chapter, I mean, is hugely important. And, you know, their ability to speed up these and, and now looking at this, this helps us get a molecular understanding of how you know, is this the right be, spelling for the Japanese sumo? thing? Sumo? Yeah, it's sumo wrestling. So, yeah, exactly. They yeah. contort you. They, yeah, can, yeah. they can put you but, in uh, but, uh, that, but I'm not too sure know. about the spelling. We'll have to look that up and make yeah, sure it makes yeah, it yeah. in the okay, video. Okay, but anyhow, sumo. the Japanese yeah. wrestling thing with, with huge guys. Yeah, yeah. So that is, will be the enzyme. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Vladi. Thank you.